Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Foundations in Faith as we continue walking through those foundational beliefs of what it means to be Christian, what it means to be Lutheran. Thank you for joining me, Pastor Andrew here. Uh, I'm glad to be working through this. It's been a lot of fun, I have to be honest, uh, kind of revisiting these foundations. It's good for us as pastors, as teachers, Pastor Steve Vicker and myself. We get all this at seminary. We dive into it big time for the, the three years we're there and then the fourth year of Vicarage, of course. Um, but it's always good to come back and revisit and work through these documents again. So I hope it's been beneficial for you as it has been for me. Today, we are talking about the church. What is the church? What does the church look like? What makes up the church? And as we follow the narrative of Scripture, this is the next step. This is really the narrative that the confessions have been walking through uh, and that Scripture walks through as well. And so we had creation and we saw God's good and perfect creation. We had the fall, the entrance of sin into that creation, the broken relationship between creation and creator, between creature and God. And we saw how God redeemed creation, how God renewed that relationship through Jesus Christ. We spent weeks talking about justification. What does that look like? At the end of Jesus' time here on earth, his earthly ministry then, the very last verses of Matthew chapter 28, um, Jesus ascends into heaven. As he's ascending, he gives this command, Go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always, he says, even to the very end of the age. The church is that next step. The church is how Christ is with us, how he fulfills that promise. Uh, Christ is with us, as he promised in the last verses of Matthew, through the Holy Spirit and through the church. The church is the body of Christ, here living and active on earth at this time and in this place. Um, to be a little more specific, what is the church? The, the writers of the Apology say specifically it is principally an association of faith and the Holy Spirit in the hearts of persons. So we look around and we see all these different churches around us. We see all these different denominations. And the temptation might be to say, well, that's not real church. That's a church, but it's not the church. And yet here the writers of the Apology are saying, no, 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 it doesn't matter about the building. Rather, it matters about faith and the Holy Spirit being present and active within that place. So what does that look like? Yes, we can say, okay, these different places may or may not be churches, but what about, say, in an Islamic mosque? Is that a church? And the, the writers of the Apology go on to say that the marks of the church, what makes a place a Christian church, at least, are these things. Namely, the pure teaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments in harmony with the gospel of Christ. Those are the two requirements. The pure teaching of the gospel straight from Scripture and that's why you'll see every weekend as we preach, we are coming straight from Scripture. That's why we invite you very often as we preach and as we teach in different Bible studies and whatnot to check us. That you all, as the congregation, should be in the Scriptures. You should be reading along as much as we do. You should be asking us those questions, checking the things that we say against Scripture. And if you find something that, that isn't affirmed within Scripture, that seems to go against Scripture, we invite you to bring that to us. Let us talk about it. So if we need to be corrected, we can be corrected. Because this is what it means to be the church, to be the body of Christ. That we are firmly founded and grounded in Scripture. That all of our preaching, all of our teaching comes straight from Scripture. Along with that then, as, as our preaching and teaching comes from the Gospel, comes from Scripture, the administration of the sacraments also needs to be biblically done. How it's portrayed within Scripture, how it's commanded and mandated within Scripture. Those two sacraments, we'll take a look in the coming weeks at those, are baptism and communion, or the Lord's Supper. Uh, and as I said, those are coming up. We'll take a look really deep. There's a lot of controversy around things like infant baptism. What is the purpose of baptism? How are we supposed to administer the Lord's Supper? What does that even look like? Um, so we'll get into those in the coming weeks. But for today, at least, it's enough to say that a mark of the church is that those sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are administered correctly. Correctly meaning as scripture has mandated. The apology goes on to say that, Moreover, this church alone is called the body of Christ, which Christ renews, sanctifies, and governs by his spirit, as Paul testifies in Ephesians chapter 1 when he says, And God has made him, Jesus, the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Therefore, those in whom Christ is not active are not members of Christ, Therefore, not members of the church. 
We'll talk about this a little bit later. Church visible, church invisible. Um, can there be non-believers within the church? It depends how you define church. We'll get there um, in just a little bit. We're not quite there yet. But uh, enough to say that the church is where the gospel is preached according to Scripture, where the sacraments are administered according to Scripture, where Christ is present, living, and active through the Holy Spirit, in, with, and through his people. So the point of that is to say the church is made up of people, not a building. It's not about the place where you gather together. Now you're saying, well, Pastor Andrew, didn't we just hear that the renovation is taking place? We had a prayer vigil yesterday to walk through that sanctuary uh, before the demo starts happening, before the changes start happening. Yes, it is not about the church building. So why are we putting money into the renovation? Why are we putting money into that building? Because it is a beautiful place to gather together to celebrate the blessings that we have in Scripture, in that preaching, in the Lord's Supper, in communion, in baptism. It's good to have a place where we can gather together to be at peace, to see the different things that Christ has done, to be reminded of the different things that Christ has done. As as we have that cross over the altar, as we have the altar and the pulpit and the lectern where the Word of God goes out, as we have that beautiful stained glass behind the altar that reminds us of Christ and his lordship over all. It's good to have a place to gather together like that, but it's not about the place. If the church were be, to be torn down for whatever reason, I'm not saying it is, please don't email Pastor Steve and say, oh, Pastor Andrew said the church is coming down. It's not. I promise the church is still going to be there. But if the building were to fall, St. Paul Lutheran Church would still go on. It's not about the building. Rather, it's about the people. The people that Christ is working in, the people that he's working through, the people that his word and sacraments come to and that can come together and celebrate and worship alongside each other. This is very clear within uh, paragraph 12 here of the Apology. When the church is defined, it must first and foremost be defined as that which is the living body of Christ. The people dwelling in Christ, hearing his word, receiving again his forgiveness in his sacraments, and also those who go out, who share the word of Christ, who do the things Christ has commanded us to do in serving our neighbors, in loving the people around us. The church is the kingdom of Christ here on earth, the reign and rule of Christ here on earth, and it is the righteousness of the heart and the gift of the Holy Spirit that Christ gives us as he promises to be with us, to work in, through, and amongst us. So there are external and internal marks of the church. This is one way we speak of it. And some external marks of the church are true. Things that you can see from the outside. You look at a church, you look at what they do, you look at the people there, you can say, that's a church. There are some external marks that are true, namely those that we've already said before. The pure teaching of the gospel according to scripture and the administration of the sacraments, again, according to Scripture. But there are other externals that we see within the church. We have plenty of them over here, right? Externals such as music choice, such as dress code, such as the people that are gathered together. What is, what is the point of all of those? And we would say that those are good in some ways. External marks of the church, the liturgy we use, the music that we use, they are good. They help direct our worship. They help show us uh, a way to be in a worshipful setting, a way to direct our thoughts, things of that nature. But they are not marks of the church. Let me, let me say that a little bit differently. If you like contemporary worship over traditional worship, you are still part of the church. Okay. If you like tr- traditional worship over contemporary worship, you're still part of the church. If you like to show up to church in jeans and a t-shirt, you're part of the church. If you want to come in a suit and your Sunday best every Sunday, you're still part of the church. These are kind of external markers that we look at when we see different churches. Some are completely based on contemporary worship. Some are completely based on traditional worship. It's not that one is better than the other. These are different styles, different external marks of the church that all come together to make up the true church the internal church, you might say. So that leads to the question, um, are there people, are there non-believers within the church? The answer to that is it depends how you define church. If we define it in the way that we have been defining it, as the people gathered together, centered around the word of Christ, 
and the sacraments being administered correctly, can there be non-believers in the church? Yes. Yes, there can. There can be people sitting in the sanctuary every Sunday who Christ has not worked faith in their heart, who don't believe the things who are, they are doing. Yeah, they might go through the motions. Yeah, they might sing the songs. Yeah, they might look good. But if Christ hasn't worked faith in their hearts, they're not part of the church. They're part of an organization. They're part of an earthly institution. But we would say they're not part of the church, capital C. At the same time, are there people who don't attend regular worship who can be part of the church? Yeah, yeah, there are. We would say that anyone who Christ has worked faith in their hearts, who hear the preaching of the word, who are in scripture, and who are partaking of the sacraments, even if it's not regularly, uh, if they're partaking of the sacraments in a biblical way, they are part of the church. So what does it mean that we have all of these external markers, all these different ways of doing worship? Does that tell us anything about the people there? Yes and no. Yes and no. It tells us Christ is living and active through his word, through his sacraments going out. It's also telling us we cannot judge the people sitting next to us towards their salvation. That's not our place. That's not our job. Our job as the church is to come together to worship God, to worship Christ for all that he's done, to receive his sacraments and his forgiveness again, and then to go and share his gospel and share his love with the people around us, to serve our neighbor. It's not our judge to say, uh, do you have saving faith or not? It's not our job to judge that. We leave that up to Christ. We serve and we worship. And that's what we're called to do. So therefore, as we add that in, uh, we have to add in that the definition of the church must also be defined as the living body of Christ. Those who have the righteousness of the heart and the gift of the Holy Spirit. These are the internal markings. These make up the true church. So as we talked about a little bit, the reason for these debates of different church, what is the church, what makes up the church, were different traditions going on and really being rejected in the time that this was written, in the Lutheran Revolution and the Reformation and all those good things. As Luther rebelled and kind of broke off from the Catholic Church, a lot of those things he left behind were some traditions of the Catholic Church, some traditions that the Lutherans were rejecting. The teaching here is that the, the human traditions that have grown around worship do not make someone part of the church or not. Okay? So the human traditions such as liturgies, such as style of worship, such as instruments that are used within worship, all of these things, again, they can be good. I love liturgy. I love traditional worship. I love worshiping in the way that generations of people have worshipped before us, of feeling that connection of that tradition. Also, the way the liturgy speaks straight from Scripture, and in doing so, orients us to God, orients us to, in that space, being focused on the Word and focused on what God has done for us. I love contemporary worship. I love seeing Keith and the band up there just worshiping their faces off and being able to shout and, and yell and sing for great joy over what Christ has done. I love that free-flowing way, not locked into the liturgy, but they're able to be up there, express themselves, and express their thanks. These are different ways, different traditions, we might say, of doing worship, different traditions within our church, and yet they are so beautiful. And it's not to say that one is better than the other. It's not to say that one makes you the church, the other means you can't be the church. And that's really where this debate came from back in the 1500s. Traditions, human traditions that have grown up around the church and grown up around worship do not make up the church. Church is defined, as we've said, by those things, uh, the preaching of the gospel straight from Scripture, the administration of the sacraments straight from Scripture, the gathering together of those whom Christ has worked faith in their hearts, who have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. It's not about the place, and it's not about the traditions. Rather, it's the individuals who are coming together, making up the church. The elders here speak very clearly. Therefore, in accordance with the scriptures, we maintain that the church is, properly speaking, the assembly of saints who truly believe the gospel of Christ and have the Holy Spirit. For the true unity of the church, it's sufficient to agree on the teaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It's not necessary that everywhere human traditions and rites or ceremonies instituted by human beings be the same. So is that crazy church way out in California that's doing only contemporary worship, are they part of the church? If they have the sacraments administered according to scripture, if they have the preaching of Christ, yes, they are the church. Are there Catholic people worshiping in Catholic churches who are part of 
the church? Yes, I think there are. I think there are saved and redeemed people in the Catholic Church. Are there uh, uh, different denominations around that are part of the church? Absolutely, I think there are. All of this to say that unity within the church, that what it means to be the church, isn't the name that you put in front of the church. The church doesn't mean Lutheran. It's not like Lutheran is the only church out there. Now, do we get a lot right? Yeah, I believe we do. There's a reason I'm a Lutheran pastor. There's a reason Pastor Steve is a Lutheran pastor. I think we have the clearest understanding we can have of Scripture of what it means to be the church. But are there other churches and other denominations that get enough right that they're the church? Yeah, they preach and teach Christ. They administer the sacraments according to Scriptures. You know, it's funny, Pastor Steve and I have talked quite a few times about um, different Bible churches that don't really call themselves a denomination. They would claim non-denominational. As we talk with the pastors and the leaders of those churches, they speak straight from Scripture. And as we talk about things like communion and baptism and worship, and they speak in the same way that we speak because they're drawing straight from Scripture. So the traditions look different maybe, but the grounding, the foundation of what they believe, why they do the things that they do is the same. It comes straight from Scripture and it points directly to Jesus Christ. There are many, many, many people and many, many denominations that are part of the church, capital C, the Catholic Church. So these are human traditions that we're talking about. Things like the style of worship, the liturgy, um, the things that you wear when you come to church. These are not necessary for what it means to be the church. And this also applies to things like food and gatherings. Do you have potlucks? Do you not have potlucks? The length of sermons. There are some churches that preach for an hour and a half. There are some churches that preach for 10 minutes. They're still the church. They still preach from scripture. They still preach Christ and him crucified. Almost everything, really, that you look at within a worship setting, that you look at within a church, is human tradition. Okay, These are things that have come from the past, come from history, that we uphold as good. Again, I love traditional worship. I love seeing what our ancestors have done, what traditional worship looked like. But for, it, for a place to be the church, for people to be the church, again, all it takes is the preaching of the scriptures, the administration of the sacraments, the Holy Spirit, working within the people that are gathered together. It's not about what you wear. It's not about the style of worship, any of that. And the authors keyed in on this very clearly, the authors of the Apology, here to say, um, Paul clearly teaches this in Colossians chapter 2 when he says, Therefore don't let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Central is Christ, preaching of him crucified. Again, uh, Colossians chapter 2, If with Christ you died to the el elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. All these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They're simply human commands and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-imposed piety, humility, and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value in checking self-indulgence. So these are different things that were happening at the time that, that the apology was written. Different, uh, you can eat this, you can't eat this, you have to celebrate this, you can't celebrate that. Different traditions within the church. Um, but the authors here are using scripture and saying, look, it doesn't matter the traditions. It doesn't matter what day you celebrate Easter on. It doesn't matter if you celebrate Christmas in December or in the spring. It doesn't matter. What matters is Christ, the centrality of Christ, the sacraments, and the preaching of him crucified for our sins. So really quickly then, uh, the question becomes, uh, what is the church visible? What is the church invisible? We've had these external and internal marks, the external traditions, the internal faith that Christ works, the gathering together of saints. Um, these are closely aligned with the church visible, the church invisible. So the church visible are those we see gathering together that profess to be Christian, that, that have these marks of the church in their lives, that come to hear the gospel, that come to hear the scriptures proclaimed, that come to receive the sacraments, the people that we see actually in the building, actually gathered together around Christ and the scriptures. The church invisible, then, is something so much greater, something that we can't see yet. We will. The promise is we will see the church. Vicar, uh, again, works through that Revelation Bible study. There's a beautiful picture of the church. 
of the gathering of saints before the throne of God. These are the, the things that we don't see. The saints that have gone before us, the heavenly throne room, uh, as God sits and rules and reigns, Christ seated as, at his right hand. We gather together with the invisible church every time we come into worship. You know, within the, the liturgy of communion and the traditional worship, we, we commonly say, profess, we gather together with the saints that have gone before us, with the angels, with the archangels, in singing and worshiping. That is so true. That is the invisible church, what it looks like to be gathered together in the throne room of God, in his presence. We get a foretaste of that. We get a tiny taste of that as we gather together Sunday mornings or Saturday nights, as we worship, as we receive communion. But we look forward to a time when we sit in heaven, when we sit in that throne room, when we sit with the invisible church now become visible to all of us as we worship our Lord and Savior. Until then, we wait for him to return. We take part in the foretaste. We gather together. We celebrate. We have that community. And we always look forward to the time of Christ's return, always looking to tell more people that he is coming back, that he loves them, and he's coming back for them. Here's what that looks like. Won't you come with us? Won't you gather with us? Won't you join this church, not this building, but this people, so that we can come together and worship Jesus for all that he's done? So as we've said many, many times here, marks of the church are the preaching of the gospel and the sacraments. Next week, we dive into sacraments. Next week begins our talk on baptism. We're going to spend a good amount of time on the sacraments, on baptism and communion, as uh, this was big debate within the time that the Apology was, was written, big d debate for Luther uh, as he kind of broke off from the Catholic Church, but also a big debate for our time and, and for our day as people ask you, why do you have your infant baptized? Well, we're going to have my little daughter baptized in just a few weeks here, three months old. She can't speak. And she can't profess her own faith. Why are we having her baptized? We'll get there. We'll get there next week, hopefully, or the week after. We'll be able to walk through those things and see why we do the things that we do. Until then, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. If you have questions, comments, want to interact at all, you can always leave a comment at the bottom of this YouTube page. I'll be able to read those and check in on them. You can also email me with any questions, thoughts, concerns you might have. Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com, stpaulboca.com. Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com. I'd love to interact with you. I'd love to walk through scriptures with you, dive into these things with you. Until next week, I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you're able to gather together Sunday morning and worship. Be in that place. Be part of the church. Yes, the building, but the people centered around Christ. I hope you're able to hear of his forgiveness, receive that forgiveness again. Have a blessed week in the Lord.